So my name is Nawal de Frelon. I am the actual uh, president of the of the local chapter uh, the, of the Etude uh, of Paris. Um, and I will uh, thank uh, Luzval for sponsoring us. In particular, uh, Luzval sponsors the uh, allow us to have this, uh, this Zoom uh, this Zoom account to host uh, our event. So here is um, the program of tonight. So I will start by a, a short introduction. And then we will have uh, three speakers. So Isabel Amel Lachan of the BRGM, uh, Elodie Willard of the uh, of Orano Group, and to finish, uh, Clio Possia from Lithium de France. So after each presentation, we will have uh, a short QA session. And at the end, uh, another one Which will uh, allow to uh, which will allow to 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 finalize uh, all all the questions uh, that can be uh, that can be left, and then uh, we will conclude. So first, uh, the main uh, news about uh, the the local chapter EAG of Paris is uh, renew the board uh, renewal. So actu actu actually, uh, today I eight members in uh, in the board plus uh, two operational members. So how it's uh, it's shown here is is uh, it is shown here in the slide, uh, and um, it's um, there will be uh, four uh, four positions uh, in the board. So president, vice president, treasurer, uh, events lead, e company relation lead. So it's a uh, five position, sorry. So see if there is anyone interested, uh, it's possible to to apply in order to, to have uh, one of this uh, of this position. And so the AG will be uh, the third uh, third of uh, of June. And actually, it's the same date of the of the EAG of the EAG of the EAG Global. I, I think uh, we didn't know at this at this moment. Um, okay, so co co sorry. Uh, actually, um, in those time, I'm, I'm working in Spanish, so I have lots of words in, in Spanish with my mind. Uh, okay, so I will uh, I will change uh, this year. I've been president since uh, 2018, so um, it has been a, a nice journey, and I think for me, uh, it's it's time to to move on. And uh, I know that for the other, uh, it's the same. So it's a very nice uh, nice moment, and it's very nice to be part of the of a local chapter. It's uh, the occasion to meet a uh, lot of people and to. To, to have uh, to be involved in the to be involved in the community, so don't hesitate to to join us in the board or as an operational member too. It's possible. Okay, another uh, hot topic is uh, get 2021. Uh, so the first uh, the first one was uh, last year. So the get 2020. And so uh, this one uh, will be uh, will be uh, also in Strasbourg. Uh, hopefully, it will be in Strasbourg. And so the the deadline for the abstract uh, is uh, well, the, the the call for abstract is uh, is now open. So don't hesitate if you have any um, any idea, any topic. So here is uh, all the topic, which uh, which will be. Uh, During, uh, during this um, this event. Okay, so the green wall, uh, as uh, as uh, as the other time, so all participants now are muted, video off, and uh, and uh, so we we'll have a QA session at the end of each uh, presentation. So we will be able to write your question in the chat. And then I will read. Uh, I will read them, and the speaker will answer. Um, so we are gathered together for the pleasure of, of sharing and learning. So thank you uh, to Isabel, Elodie, and Clio. And so we we will start.
So we will start with uh, Isabel with the presentation French Metropolitan Mining Potential Reappraisal in some selected critical metals. So I will start present Isabel. So she is the head of the Mineral Resource Unit in the Geo Resource Division of the BRGM. So since uh, 2017, she is involved in, to support public policies, improving responsible mining and promoting international exploration program with the French Geological Survey. So Isabel has uh, 15 years of professional experience in the mining industry for mineral resources exploration or characterization and already in benefi beneficiation mineral processing. So Isabel has a PhD of the University of Lorraine and uh, Creju and a master, de and a master degree from uh, UCAM. So, Thank you, Isabelle, and uh, the floor is to you. Thank you. Uh, so let me, I... uh, I'm not sure if I can put my camera on. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here, is everybody can see my presentation. Yes, yes, very nice. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Nawal, and, and thank you, uh, uh, everyone, uh, to come and join us. So um, um, I'm going to, to introduce this workshop session on the uh, EAG uh, local chapter in Paris. Uh, so this evening I will present you a, an overview uh, on uh, the past research and exploration programs uh, that uh, were conducted by the BRGM, the French Geological Survey of France. Uh, I will focus uh, only on the metropolitan part of our country uh, and uh, on the ongoing reappraisal of uh, some mineral resources potentiality that are driven currently by the critical assessment for uh, our industry and, and uh, technologies. I will focus uh, uh, on some snapshots on, uh, on four critical raw materials uh, that are present in France, uh, tungsten, antimony, tin, and, and lithium. Uh, so France are, are, have strong still strong opportunities in those four commodities. However, a lot of capacity building is also present uh, in our overseas territories or, or other commodities, but uh, well, it's a, a small screen view. Uh, France has been a, a precursor for uh, geophysical airborne exploration starting early at the end of the 60s uh, with the development of technologies for uh, signal measurements. IOL um, geophysics brought numerous windows um, of knowledge on our underground capacities and on uh, mineral potentiality with various programs up to the uh, 80s. Um, so here uh, you have uh, an overview of the aeromagnetic uh, uh, anomalies cover that uh, we have uh, uh, done so far, and an example here uh, on the quality of uh, map uh, representing the here in red the magnetic uh, anomalies as first order, and for example the uh, uranium anomalies in, in yellow in western uh, part of France. Um, so. What is uh, uh, important to note is that uh, in the past uh, 90s, the geophysical surveys of France uh, conducted for our collectivities were mainly dedicated to environmental purposes, deep 3D geological or structural mapping to conduct natural risk analysis, uh, or to research uh, water resources or, or evaluation of uh, cavities, rocks, and material volumes. But uh, the, the new uh, geophysical aerial surveys were not dedicated for the, the, the mining um, uh, uh, exploration. So nowadays, the uh, the geophysical methods and its applications continue to develop with uh, higher resolution refinement, 
uh, smaller scale and, and lower cost uh, using, for example, uh, UAV developments or specific instrumentation like um, electromagnetic cell driven by helicopter that help a lot on uh, high relief uh, regions, for example. So uh, here is an example of uh, current and, and new geophysical surveys uh, uh, that are conducted uh, over overseas France. But uh, we hopefully uh, think that uh, uh, we should continue the exploration with uh, those uh, new geophysical methods uh, on metropolitan uh, to, to have a look on uh, new potentialities because we were not looking at the same um, 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 elements before when uh, we have conducted our uh, past uh, mineral inventory in France. So uh, the French uh, Exploration uh, National Programme and the Mineral Resources Inventory that has been uh, ordered by the government after the, the oil shock and uh, uh, were, was conducted by the BRGM between the, the 1975 and 1991 across the metropole and uh, later in some overseas region. So it was mainly oriented to the general raw material potential overview and uh, conducted uh, by surfacial geochemical stream sediment campaigns, um, alluvial and wall rock sampling, geochemical analysis on, on different uh, strategic basement areas. So here on the map, you can see uh, the locations where the, the geochemical uh, survey was done in the uh, uh, branch and in the colored part on the map grid. So finally, as you can see during this inventory, only 20% uh, of the metropole has been covered. Uh, but the survey, uh, um, I mean, the, uh, we were looking at uh, different uh, elements that we are not uh, looking at the same now. And um, as the demand and the used um, apparatus of, um, of the analytical devices also used uh, during those campaigns, are now more precise. Um, uh, only a few selected samples have been uh, analyzed. For example, uh, here you have uh, in, in blue and in red uh, the cover for some uh, critical raw materials, tungsten and lithium. And it shows that um, uh, we still have work if we want to have a, a good uh, screen and exploration program uh, on France uh, metropolitan. So this past uh, in inventory I've conducted to uh, the discovery of uh, at least uh, 2,000 new occurrences. Uh, and here you have a, a, a good overview of now what is the mining potential of, of metropolitan France and of the activity of, uh, of the mines in France. So we have uh, uh, 176 licenses in France uh, on metropolitan and overseas, but only uh, 20 active mining licenses uh, in metropolitan. Um, so currently, uh, in operation, so mostly on source, bauxite, fluorine, bituminous carbonate schists, but um, uh, not on, on, on critical raw materials. Uh, so we have um, uh, uh, exploration that uh, are of on interest, but on you for the, uh, the moment, three new claims for exploration. Um, so a lot to, to conduct. The critical Criticality assessment for France uh, is uh, driven by, by the Committee for Strategic Metals, the COMES, Comité pour les Métaux Stratégiques in French. And uh, uh, at least uh, 24 commodities uh, have been studied so far by BRGM. Uh, so you can see the, the sort of matrix that can sh that show you uh, how um, we measured uh, criticality. Uh, so there are two, two, two parts. The first part is the supply risk for, for France, uh, which is uh, driven by the location of, of uh, the identified reserves of primary resources and the location of the deposits uh, that are uh, producing. And uh, it is driven also by the world production uh, um, of the, uh, the producers, but also uh, 
uh, the strengths and, and weakness of each uh, uh, productive countries. So there are still uh, a lot of risk factors that can conduct to a high uh, risk on the supply chain if uh, only one dip for example, one main deposit is located in a country with a, uh, with a um, um, risk uh, uh, of war, uh, well, it will conduct, uh, of course, of um, uh, a supply risk, uh, important and ge geopolitical uh, tension uh, for, for France. On the other side, you have the uh, strategic importance uh, for the French industries and the national economies. So depending on, on who is asking uh, and who is regarding uh, the, the different commodities, uh, uh, you will have a different point of view on the criticality of raw materials, of course. So um, uh, this is at least valid for, for the uh, most of uh, industries in France. So I will, I will uh, give you some, some um, screenshots on four uh, of these elements. Uh, so tungsten is a good example because it's uh, highly uh, critical uh, uh, for considering the, the high risk on the supply uh, disruption and also of the economic importance for the French industries. Um, you have also, well, lithium and uh, antimony. Uh, which are uh, moderate uh, to high uh, in uh, 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 for criticality assessment, and tin, which is uh, more uh, moderate, but uh, still uh, on regards. So here is our uh, reappraisal uh, of our potential on tungsten in metropolitan France. Uh, the uses are driven by uh, the uh, cemented carbides, uh, steels, and hard metals uh, uh, super alloys. Um, and uh, so it is really useful for all the, the well, uh, mining finally industries, uh, drilling, cutting tools, but also for automotive and, and aerospace or defense. Um, so many known resources are, 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 are present in France, uh, but uh, most of, uh, of them. Uh, where, well, the, the, the prospection was uh, ended uh, uh, almost uh, at the end of the 90s because of the um, prices uh, decrease of tungsten and the discoveries of uh, other um, uh, producers. Uh, and uh, there are uh, two distinct types of deposits in France of tungsten. There are the, the scans uh, uh, deposits and um, the um, quartz wolframite veins. So um, uh, for each one, you have two distinct bearing, uh, mainly bearing minerals. Um, for scans, you have the shilite uh, and, uh, and, and the quartz wolframite, well, it's for, for, for from it, uh, minerals. So France has, has been a, an important producer um, uh, before the 90s. The past production was uh, uh, around 25,000 tons of, of tungsten. It's a total uh, historical production. Uh, for one side, so here you have an example of the ore uh, uh, characteristic uh, on the uh, Anglade deposit. Um, they used to, to, uh, to product uh, 12,000 tons uh, in this um, uh, shilite uh, uh, or deposits uh, in Salo, in Anglet. Um, and uh, what is uh, interesting is that um, uh, after the inventory uh, of France, uh, there, we have discovered a, a, a new deposit which uh, was uh, uh, very interesting, the Fumat uh, uh, deposit uh, in Tarn here, in, it's circled in, in red. And uh, finally, uh, the, the prices um, start to go down uh, at the end uh, of the 90s. And finally, uh, even if the deposit was interesting and resources started to be uh, evaluated, uh, the, the exploration stopped. And finally, uh, this um, um, deposit uh, has not been uh, completely uh, uh, well evaluated and they are uh, and never uh, been in production. So it's a very important and interesting deposit. It's a scan deposit, uh, so in, in the tarn uh, department. And uh, all grades uh, here versus uh, the tonnage for comparison with other uh, worldwide scan deposits. 
and show you that um, the tonnage is uh, at least not very important for the moment on the resource uh, uh, last evaluation of the deposits. Uh, however, uh, the, um, uh, the drill holes uh, are, have not uh, so uh, well, you can still uh, uh, do more explorations and, uh, and uh, continue to have uh, some reserves. Um, uh, uh, counting, uh, but the average ore grade was uh, was also very interesting compared to other deposits, uh, with different uh, levels um, of um, of um, ore grades, uh, which are, are pretty um, important and can be interested. Um, so on on the last. Um, uh, Evaluation of the market review uh, forecast uh, for the 2030 uh, made by uh, MRC uh, on tungsten this year. Uh, it shows that uh, the global market is going to, to grow probably with the return on uh, automotive and, and, um, and uh, aerial uh, um, uh, plane uh, industry coming back. Uh, so probably that normally it should be interested to have a look on that uh, on that all. For antimony uh, in France, um, uh, some uses are, are, are more on uh, flame retardant material or batteries uh, and insulating shielding or plaster additives. So we have also a good potential in France uh, that is, um, as you can see on the, the different uh, basement parts. So here uh, um, in the um, antimony, um, sorry, uh, um, in um, the western uh, part of, uh, of France uh, basement here, um, you are, we have uh, reevaluated um, uh, uh, and uh, conducted some predictive assessment uh, on uh, the different zones uh, with uh, uh, the last uh, postdoctor, uh, 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 post PhD, I mean, uh, Anthony Pochon, that made a, a new assessment uh, on the antimony uh, in the Variscan uh, Armorican belt. And it shows that uh, it is specially uh, correlated with a high density magnetic zones in those area uh, with uh, along the big uh, uh, structure of uh, of the or um, um, of the basement here, and so it was probably reflecting uh, the presence of um, of bodies at, at depth um, that could be very interesting to to prospect uh, again along those uh, old um, ore deposits. So it's probably a good key uh, to continue the prospection of those deformational belts. And also maybe to, to have a look uh, also on the uh, last um, uh, tailings of those old mines, because they are still potential with uh, the, uh, the beneficiation uh, processing that uh, have, uh, uh, um, I mean, um, uh, more efficient now um, uh, with the ongoing uh, research. Uh, then um, here you have an, uh, some example of uh, uh, tin um, 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 on tin uh, deposits in, in France. So tin uh, are, are used for electronic uh, welding and semiconductors or, or alloying. So it's uh, still of very importance. Uh, for all uh, numeric uh, purposes and new technologies. Uh, so there are different types of, of, of deposit in France. You have uh, quartz vein stockworks, uh, like uh, here. So we've got uh, pegmatites uh, um, um, uh, and uh, quartz veins with um, uh, cassiterite. So it's an oxide of, uh, of tin. Uh, there are no, they are um, uh, in place and closed to uh, paraluminous granites, uh, and uh, also present in uh, stock shaders here. So it's uh, uh, you have two different uh, uh, um, uh, granites and a composition here of pegmatites, and um, uh, tin is located in those uh, pegmatites here in the Montebra um, ore. Uh, in Echassier, there are just uh, one uh, uh, deposit for the moment that is uh, uh, producing. Uh, so the domain, the uh, uh, the main uh, product uh, on uh, Echassier that is uh, producing um, uh, by uh, Imeri Ceramic France is producing only a few tons of um, 
capacity right and also a tantalite uh, uh, concentrate that are linked to some pegmatites that are up to uh, to a grazing uh, uh, deposits. But the dominant uh, production uh, in, is finally a query of, of uh, kaolins, kaolinites. Um, and uh, in France, there's also high potential uh, in lithium. Uh, so lithium, as you, you know all, is uh, um, uh, used for lithium uh, ion batteries for the new electric vehicles and uh, also for ceramics and glass or in, uh, in the metallurgy. Uh, main deposits, uh, well, there are two types of deposits. Well, the first type is in hard rock uh, with uh, several different bearing minerals. Uh, here is the new uh, last lithium potential assessment that has uh, been done by BRGM using uh, the CBA method uh, approach also that has been conducted uh, to the European scale uh, also by uh, uh, Blandin Bourseol. And uh, as you can see, uh, even if there are only few lithium uh, known occurrences uh, in uh, uh, pegmatite, LCT pegmatite or, or rare granites, well, we have also uh, a lot of potential uh, on the different parts of the old basement and uh, uh, mainly in the uh, massive central uh, mountains. Um, and uh, well, you, I, I think Cleo Bosia is going to present more on that, but uh, we have also discovered that there are a, a potential, good potential of lithium in uh, deep geothermal brine deposits. Um, so Cleo will, will talk uh, more on that, but uh, Beachim is part of, of the project uh, each July, uh, um, which is coordinated by Ahmed Group. Um, and uh, founded by the IT Raw Materials uh, European uh, Programme. And uh, well, it uh, shows clearly that there's a potential in Europe and in France uh, for the uh, lithium uh, capture uh, in those deep uh, brines. Um, so some uh, new, some tests have, uh, uh, are conducted right now in uh, Sous uh, Souforet uh, in, um, in uh, Eastern France. So this outlooks, it's just a, 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 a screenshot finally of, uh, finally you have evolving interest in the different metals regarding the te technological innovation and uh, depending on the end uses that uh, are driving the conception. So um, because uh, it's uh, evolving, uh, it's very important to continue finally the research and the exploration, uh, even if, uh, uh, if you think that you know well the geology uh, uh, of your country, because you still have, uh, uh, finally, we have in France a relatively old aerial geophysical survey over metropolitan France. And so using the new technologies, I think we could bring uh, um, uh, more interesting and more refinement finally on, on the deep potential uh, for new deposits. Um, we have also a limited uh, data on historical uh, data on geochemical uh, analysis um, for the critical raw materials in our past inventories. So it's uh, also interesting to uh, evaluate on the different commodities that we are looking for. And uh, we have no systematic uh, multi-elemental geochemical analysis during exploration campaigns of, uh, of um, uh, the operation miners also. So um, we have seen also that the evolution of the geological knowledge and the genetic models can uh, drive to new sort of deposits also, like for example, we are now looking lithium also in, uh, in deep geothermal brines and looking at the different source of, uh, of lithium that could generate um, these uh, lithium concentrations. So it's very important to continue those research and to, um, uh, well, maybe also to reprocess the mining waste and the tailings from the old historical mining sites uh, with um, uh, more efficient technologies. So the supply risk uh, disruption evolves uh, continuously, especially with the pandemic context and the pressure on the different markets. 
um, and and the new uh, well protection policies of uh, the different governments that can uh, um, uh, give some tension uh, in the world market. Um, so the evolution of the uh, the state strategy right now in France uh, is more according on the economic importance uh, for the industrial um, uh, dependency, and uh, so we could think again of uh, reallocating some primary production for the very high uh, critical raw materials uh, uh, and to um, uh, uh, to open maybe uh, some new some uh, old uh, mine sites that have not been uh, uh, producing since uh, a lot of time so this uh, reappraisal of the French metropolitan potential uh, in some selected critical metals is uh, essential and, and show uh, promising, um, interesting uh, results. So for uh, tungsten, tin and antimony in the various canorogenic belts, for example, uh, in Armorican, uh, uh, Western France and the central uh, massifs also. And uh, lithium in hard rocks and both on geothermal uh, brines. And uh, this year, the legal mining framework uh, policy is currently reassessed uh, by the French government. So maybe we will have uh, new opportunities uh, in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, so we have uh, several uh, questions. So I will uh, write them uh, to you. Uh, okay, so French uh, French question from Jean-Jacques. Mm -hmm. Alors, euh, allô. Ça l'eau devait être reprise par Varis quand mine. Mm -hmm. Je vais te répondre. Qu'en penses-tu et qu'en pense le BRGM? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to answer in English <laughs> for everybody. Uh, I think the the big uh, um, challenge in France will be, of course, on, on the slow, on the social acceptance of, uh, of uh, uh, letting um, the population uh, having mines close to their house. As you know, uh, there's, um, uh, well, the density of population in France, it's a small country, and there's a high density of population. So, uh, of course, they are used to um, uh, to the past mining uh, processing. I mean that uh, they, they are living close to old mine sites that have been uh, left uh, at the end of the, of the great uh, mining time. And uh, it was 30 years ago, and there are not a lot of uh, uh, mining operations now. So it means that the people doesn't know uh, why we are mining and 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 that it's because of their consumption, of the consumption of everybody, finally. So I think to reopen minds, we have to, to convince that we can do with better uh, and responsible processing uh, than uh, 30 years ago. And I think it's the challenge is to have a demonstration. Uh, so, of course, uh, Australians, uh, when they arrived uh, to trying to invest in France, uh, uh, it was a bit cold with the different populations around. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, it has to be driven uh, with the population, with the industries and with the government if we want to, to start again and to increase uh, uh, and to secure our supply in those um, um, in those elements in commodities, so it's um, it's a, a, a work, a communal work that we have to do together if we if we want to convince the population. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um. Uh, another one from Jean-Jacques, so in French too, uh, but you can uh, say it uh, after in English. Mm -hmm. Nouveau code minier sera un progrès ou un carcan? <laughs> well, well, we have to let the chance uh, uh, on the new code. I think uh, it, it, we have to have a new code because it has been a, a long time uh, since uh, 
uh, its past revision. Huh? It, uh, uh, it has been very long, and I think the new code is taking into account uh, well the social uh, impacts and the environmental impacts also. So it's um, it has been uh, uh, built on the history of uh, of uh, old mining projects in France. So I think it was necessary. Then we have to the government has also to to push and to help industries uh, for the, for to secure their supply. So it has to be it will take time anyway in in France uh, because it has to be with a. To be done with the, the uh, confidence, with trans transparency, and with the, the uh, population agreement, it won't be done without their agreement. And so, I think uh, we have to think on on new capacity um, um, on the different um, uh, new mining processing that we are thinking that it's possible probably to, to start with all tailings maybe, and to do treatment also uh, on, on to, to clean environmental issue of all mining sites. It maybe has to be to, to start with that and to show that we can, we can do better than before. Okay, um, we have a, a last question and then there, is, uh, there are others, but for the end of the, the presentation. Et nous avons euh, plus généralement, que faudrait-il mettre, faudrait mettre en place pour, pa pour passer de l'exploration à l'exploitation plus intensif Henri. Maybe some smaller modular mining. Um, it, it could be done like, maybe, like, maybe like that. And, um, uh, and to have also uh, the participation of the population, for example, on the controls. It's maybe one of part of the solution to show that uh, they are, um, well, that everything is done with transparency. I think in other countries, um, uh, they start to, um, uh, to, to, to imply the, the the people uh, uh, involved uh, for the moment in the uh, decision of management. Uh, and that can be also a part of the solution to discuss and to, to, to find the best uh, uh, position. But uh, smaller maybe mines uh, uh, to, you know, to, to target more clearly some, uh, some um, um, uh, interesting deposits will be maybe a, a part also of the solution on uh, well for France, for example. Okay. Um, okay well, thank you, thank you, Isabel. Welcome. We we'll stop now. We thank you for the other question. We will uh, ask them uh, at the end of the presentations. Mm -hmm. I will share my screen. Uh, maybe Isabel has to stop oh. sharing first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here? It's fine? Okay. Can you share my screen? Okay, so now we move to the second presentation from uh, Willow Willard. So, geophysics for uranium deposit characterization in Orano mining, standard practices, recent development and evolution linked to digital transformation. So, Elodie is the head of the geophysics group in Orano mining. She has more than 12 years of experience in the use of geophysical methods for exploration, production, and environmental monitoring of, for uranium mining which uh, include airborne uh, uh, and ground multiphysics, loading and petrophysics for reservoir characterization and handheld analytic tool. So you so have uh, a PhD from the Institut Physique du Globe de, de Paris. Uh, so thank you Elodie for, uh, for joining and thank you for this presentation. It's, it's your turn. 
Thank you, Nawal. So I will share my screen. So it's okay. Can you see it? Okay. So thank you, everybody. Good evening. I have the pleasure to present you some geophysical activity done by uranium mining for uranium exploration. So first, let's start with Orano. So Orano is a group centered on uh, nuclear fuel cycle and geophysics activities uh, are performed within Orano mining at the upstream part of the cycle. What does it mean, Orano mining for the group? You can see on this slide some key numbers. So more than 3,000 employees uh, worldwide. We are one of the three top producers of uranium in the world with 7,000 tons of uranium produced and more than 1 billion of revenue last year. We have several uh, subsidiary in the world with um, exploration mainly done in Canada, Uzbekistan, Mongolia, and uh, for mining sites in operation in three countries, in Canada, Kazakhstan, and Niger. Uh, we have also in charge a different form of site uh, in terms of uh, environmental monitor monitoring in Canada, France, Niger, and Gabon. Concerning geophysics, uh, uh, each site performing exploration or production has its own geophysical department. All uh, departments have uh, logging activities and only Canada and France have uh, people dedicated to general geophysics. And in France, we have also a calibration center uh, for um, calibration of uh, radiometric uh, tools. So before to present geophysical activities, I would like to start with a quick reminder of what is the mine life cycle for those who are not very used with mining activities. It is quite the same that the life cycle of uh, oil and gas uh, uh, activities, uh, but uh, I, I like to, to start by this slide. Uh, so in mining, we start of course with exploration from reg regional to local scale. Then we move to the construction step production phase and finish with the remediation of sites. After we maintain environmental uh, monitoring of uh, our former sites. Uh, of course, it's not so linear. On subsidiary, we can have different projects at different level of maturity. That's to say, mining production uh, can operate while exploration continues uh, nearby. And uh, what about geophysicists in Orano? Yeah, geophysicists in Orano uh, operate at all stages of uh, this life cycle, usually by starting by uh, with remote sensing or airborne survey for a regional scale assessment, but we can also deploy this kind of acquisition for environmental purpose. Well, then we move to local investigation with ground survey and look logging activities. Uh, just to, to notice that logging activities uh, represent uh, merely around 80% of geophysics implemented uh, on all the subsidiaries uh, combined as uh, um, in uranium mining, gamma logging is used uh, as a direct tool for resource estimation process. We have also in charge a portable analytics tool as infrared and uh, XRF uh, measurement and of course uh, radiometry expertise is uh, uh, the core of a job for a geophysicist in Orano in terms of interpretation but also in terms of um, instrumentation. So now I will focus on main deposits uh, that Orano are looking for. And first uh, one is called uh, roll front deposit. Uh, we can find uh, them on the subsidiary of uh, Mongolia, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and are located on sedimentary basin within permeable sandstone. So they are bonded uh, above and below by impermeable layers such as clay formation and the mechanism for deposit formation is a uh, dissolution of uranium from the formation or uh, nearby sources and the transport of this uranium uh, into the permeable uh, units. And 
when redox condition change, uranium precipitates to form a front in the direction of a ground, ground water flow. So here I put in the left side uh, some example of rough front geometry. Here you have uh, XY projection of a mineralization. So it gives you an idea of the extent of a mi mineralization. So you have uh, a 10 kilometer large and six uh, kilometer uh, long. And uh, on the right side, you, are, you can see a cross section uh, in depth. So in uh, yellow color, you have the oxidized part. In white color, you have the permeable uh, reduced part. In green, the clay. And in reddish color, uh, all the mineralization uh, body. So you can see the extent here uh, near, near uh, two, two kilometers. So this kind of deposit can be located uh, from 100 meter to 700 uh, meter depth, depending on site. Uh, and how geophysics can help to explore this kind of deposits. So I put you the uh, schematic uh, strategy of geophysics uh, for, uh, for investigating this kind of object. So in blue, uh, what I would call the, the standard practice, and in uh, orange, uh, what uh, we try to put uh, in terms of R&D and innovation. So to, to start, we will try to implement a potential, potential fleet field like uh, magnetic or gravimetric field uh, to characterize the basement uh, geometry. We can also implement radiometric uh, survey at, at large scale to, to detect potential uranium sources uh, at the uh, surface. And then we move on, on uh, logging uh, activities to characterize uh, mineral uh, mineralization and uh, also all things around the lithology and stratigraphy uh, by uh, implementing resistivity logging or a portable analytical tool. Uh, in terms of RED, I, I will not give a lot of detail today, but uh, the main challenge we are facing now is trying to, to better characterize the disequilibrium of uh, uranium uh, directly in a borehole and uh, also all the um, problematic around reservoir char characterization uh, like uh, porosity and permeability assessment. So the, the second main deposit uh, Orano are looking for uh, are located in Matabasque Basin in Canada and are called inconformity related uh, uranium deposits. The target here is uh, intersection between graphitic shear zone and the Atabasca Basin. Here on the, on the right, you uh, can see an empirical geological model of this kind of deposits within, with uh, in yellow color, the sandstone, the Athabasca sandstone, and the Archean basement, uh, where structure have uh, favored the circulation and fluid. Uh, the fluid uh, will help to precipitate uh, uranium, but also uh, alteration alterate uh, the basement and the sandstone and uh, uh, the, the graphite, sorry. And uh, this two last feature, so alteration and, and graphite, is uh, very important for geophysicists because uh, they are pi path uh, finder, in, particula in particularly uh, the, the graphite, because they can be easily detectable uh, by uh, electromagnetic methods. The tricky thing is um, still that uh, they are generally thin, uh, discontinuous, is deeply deep in, and we don't really know where they end uh, at, uh, at depth. So what is the strategy in terms of geophysics? So still we we are we will go from uh, airborne to sample uh, uh, analysis, but uh, we start uh, often with time domain uh, electromagnetic uh, investigation to locate main conductors and uh, assess uh, quickly the favorability of an area. We have also information about the magnetic field to uh, allowing us uh, to make um, a pseudo lithology of basement, also to, to make some structural um, uh, map. Uh, we then switch to TDM, but uh, on ground to refine location of conductor and define target uh, for geo 
geologist. We can also uh, deploy gravimetry and resistivity survey in order to have uh, additional clue concerning uh, potential alt alteration process and uh, give a uh, additional favorability to an, to an area. And then we move uh, so to logging. So of course, uh, for all our, our deposits, we will have radiometric, but we will have uh, also in Atabasca Basin resistivity, uh, still for alteration characterization and televiewer for structural information. Um, then we can also have uh, petrophysics uh, study in order to have the footprint of uh, the, the, the deposits of the occurrence. Uh, so we will make uh, density, uh, magnetic susceptibility, uh, acoustic, and so on, this kind of measurement, but also infrared portable measurement to, to also have um, additional information about alteration and uh, mineralogical characterization. And what uh, are the current challenge in terms of R&D and innovation for this kind of deposits? Uh, it's to, to address multi-scale uh, reconciliation. So to do that, uh, we, we have several tools, but we work mainly on uh, inversion and we can find inversion with uh, geology. So to do that, we need to work on constraint inversion and also to improve uh, um, our way to model uh, complex uh, a priori model in a geophysical algorithm. Sorry, I put you some example to, to show you uh, how powerful can be a constraint invasion uh, to drive targeting in, in uranium. So um, it's, here it is a gravimetric survey uh, and we make uh, inversion. So in, on that part, you have unconstrained inversion. And as usual, when you make inversion on, on a potential field, you retrieve blob, blobby anomaly. So it is a low density anomaly that we we associate uh, to alteration. So then after when we start to, to add a constraint to a priori model, uh, constraint derived from uh, density measurement on borehole, we can see that we can um, decrease the volume of the anomaly and refine it uh, at the position, at the same position that where the alteration was was observed by the geologist. Here in, in blue, you have alteration. In, in pink, you have uh, the low density derived from the constraint inversion. And here you have the mineralization. So this kind of process and constraint inversion help to uh, optimize the, the drill hole uh, targeting. Uh, second case study for the Atabasca Basin. Uh, I told you that uh, to, to, to make a better constraint inversion, in particular for uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, method, we need to improve uh, our algorithm. For now, I just put you some example. What are uh, the standard practices of uh, modeling a graphitic body in uh, Urano? In Orano is uh, using 2D plate modeling software. That is to say that here you have the plate, so uh, we suppose that it is a graphitic body, and we we try to um, simulate the same signal that you we we measured on the field. So here it is a very simple case. We we didn't face a lot uh, to to to. Often we have a more complex uh, case than, than this one. Uh, but by doing that, we, we simplify a lot of the, um, the geology and it is no, no use to use to, to introduce this kind of, uh, of modeling to, to make uh, constrained inversion. So we need to uh, image complex geology and traditional rect rectilinear meshes are not suitable to accommodate thin plates. Uh, like a graphitic body. So we develop partnership with uh, Mem Memorial University to develop a modeling algorithm of, uh, of course, a free enfin, TDM uh, uh, signal, uh, taking account of uh, un unstru unstructured uh, grid and uh, allowing us to have a very refined mesh on the graphitic bodies. So now we have a forward modeling code and we expect it to have uh, hopefully uh, uh, an inversion content. 
So, so uh, before to switch uh, to another case study, I just want to to present to you uh, the 10 te technologies uh, that are um, supported by the Oreno innovation. So in blue, I put all the in innovation of, of the technology we put in place in, in the geophysical department. And the other one is uh, for Orano Group, but uh, we can see that uh, we are talking about, about uh, IoT instrumentation, uh, of course, uh, mainly on nuclear measurement, uh, drones, 3D modeling, simulation, data analytics, and artificial intelligence. And now, uh, how uh, digital transformation transformation uh, help uh, Orano to to work on that At Atabasca de deposits. Here I put you uh, an example of how uh, machine learning improve uh, our 3D physical property model. Uh, so here you have uh, an example of uh, spectrum uh, acquired with uh, infrared uh, equipment. So from this uh, spectrum we can uh, deduce the mineralogical association and uh, from uh, uh, a deep analysis of uh, this uh, mineral mineralogical uh, association, we can see if we have a relation with uh, petrophysical law. So we have a lot of uh, database and we were able to do that and we see that we have uh, some pretty correlation with different kind of uh, uh, infrared uh, interpretation and uh, petrophysics like uh, res resistivity or uh, density. So from this uh, observation, we were able to uh, develop a predictive algorithm to uh, feed our database in terms of petrophysics. What, uh, what, what, um, what we can do now, here an example of uh, a database. So we have Drehol with the real measurement we, we, we made with uh, petrophysics. So it's density. We make a real measurement on density of on sample. Uh, and on the other drill hall, we didn't have a measurement, uh, but we have infrared measurement. So now with a uh, predictive algorithm, we are able to predict uh, the density uh, from infrared on this drill hall. And then after, uh, uh, before we, we had, a, I would say, a standard 3D, 3D physical model, but now we are able also to, to create augmented 3D physical model thanks to this uh, predicted uh, petrophysics. Now, uh, another kind of uh, innovation, uh, merely on the uh, use of new kind of sensor, I uh, would like to mention you, present you the muon tomography done on MacArthur River Mine. So muon uh, um, application of muon tomography, it's a new method for imaging uh, density contrast uh, underground using uh, cosmic rays for imaging dense uh, uranium deposit because uranium is it's a metal uh, very, very dense. And uh, this is an example. So on the mine in Canada, here in purple, you have, we, we already know where was the mineral, mineralized pod. And we place here a different uh, muon sensor. And here we, this is, this is the result, in fact, of the 3D density invasion from muon topo tomography. And uh, we, we were able to reconstruct uh, with a great detail where the mineralist point was. So, okay, we are able to image uh, the, the, the deposit uh, that we already don't know, but uh, now what we wanted to locate a new extension uh, uh, to existing our body. So, it can be uh, by using uh, this kind of sensor we, we put in on on the ground mine, but we are working also, Orano Canada work on uh, the development of a new borehole tool on, for Muon tomography. So rapidly now I just switch on different topics. Uh, so um, for the geophysics, uh, Geophysics uh, department. We are working also so on the UAV uh, de deployment. So. Uh, up to now, uh, mostly on photogrammetric uh, to, to make 3D modeling uh, for a uh, former site, but also mine in operation. 
to make a calculation of uh, stockpile volume calculation. And uh, we also work of uh, trying to connect uh, our, our uh, I would say, historical uh, sensor to a smartphone, smartphone and, and tablet. And to finish, uh, the last development we made, uh, it's a sunstone, uh, donc a sensor here, you can see here, a, a georeference sensor in radiometric. Uh, and uh, we can, we are able now to measure the mineralization on, on mine and direct uh, to, to, to send uh, in real time information to a, a, a post, a command uh, office and uh, send uh, information to the truck uh, in order to better optimize the, the selection of uh, the, the materials, the ore in the mine and send it directly on the plant. So that's it for me. Just uh, want to share the reference that was mentioned on the slide and thank you for uh, your ad attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you already for the presentation. So we will move to the to the questions. Uh, okay. So the first one from Jean-Jacques. So my question is not directly linked to the subject, but I think that the sedimentological and reservoir flow studies could be better used in the in the case of whole front deposits. What is your personal feeling? Um, I, 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 the flow, you mean, you mean the hydrogeological uh, modeling? I've, we, we have a different um, R&D project on that part, but uh, what I would like to mention, and I, I add a slide on that, <laughs> is that uh, um, the world front deposits are operate, uh, are produced uh, by in situ recovery. So we have, in fact, uh, so we, we produce uh, uh, by injecting um, uh, some solvent in the permeable formation, and uh, we 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 pump uh, in a producer, and and we we get the uranium like this. So we have, uh, of course, a lot of uh, problematic that it is um, quite uh, similar than in petroleum. The so the only problem we had, but it is a major problem, is that uh, the sandstone is not really the sandstone. It's an uh, unconsolidated sandstone. And you have a photography here. So it's rather like a soil. And it is very difficult to to have a robust uh, petrophysical measurement on that kind of sample. So we have a look on all the, um, of course, all all the, the oil and gas uh, practice on on those uh, thematics because uh, uh, they are they are uh, more advanced on that subject than, than us. But uh, we have to face to 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 some problematic with our own geology and uh, concerning the flow study or it I, I didn't catch it. It is uh, hydro chemistry or of flow study, but but we have also. R&D project or uh, and uh, industrialized uh, operational tool to to simulate uh, the flow the flow inside um, uh, the deposits. I, I I don't know if it's answer the question, but um, okay. I hope so. <laughs> it's possible for the for the other to uh, for the participant to unmute uh, if you want to to say something as well. Okay. May I say something, Jean-Jacques? Uh, I just uh, address this question to Elodie, uh, and I would like, before that, uh, to to say that uh, our presentation was very good and very interesting about uh, all those uh, methods uh, related to geophysics in uranium. But my, my question was only, I mean, reservoir modeling, transmissivity, which is uh, the study of the flow, of water or whatever you want. Uh, I mean, a, a brine, if you want, if you prefer, with, because I know that you, you produce by injecting uh, acid inside the deposit. So, uh, I mean, reservoir modeling, transmissivity based on depositional models, that's all. And may, maybe you have partially uh, answered my question because you say about the, the reservoir modeling of uh, petroleum industry, but 
I think, I really think after having uh, seen a lot of presentations on those uh, role front uh, uh, depositions, that th there is a, a, a large uh, room for improvement and uh, that you should uh, take care of that. And, uh, maybe uh, simulate the injection of your acid uh, brines inside the reservoir and according to a spe uh, specific reservoir modeling. Thank you, Henry. Okay, I, I'm maybe not the right person to answer the question because I'm not the hydrogeologist, but uh, I know that we have tools to to model the flu the flu the, f the flow of uh, injecting uh, solvent. Uh, what what in a kit? In, yes, uh, we we have tools uh, to to modeling to model the the flow of uh, solvent fluid but uh, to take into account the, the we, we put already the geological model inside the, the, the modeling in fact uh, we I, I, I'm not sure if uh, you are talking about may, maybe uh, or maybe it is not the, the time to, to discuss about that but okay, okay. I, I will not be the, 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 the right person to to, to answer the question so okay. maybe the next question. <laughs> Uh, Elodie, I, uh, there is another question, and we will um, move to the next presentation. So a question okay. from Henri. Is the current consumption of uranium greater than the uranium discovery? Can we estimate the, can we estimate the date of, of an uranium peak lack for oil? You, you mean uh, the peak uh, then after there is a, a, a peak in terms of price? Or a, a peak and then after the decrease and the, the date, <laughs> the, the depth of uranium uh, production, but um, and not we we don't have we don't have a peak uh, because we have constant. Uh, uh, in fact, we have uh, an increasing demand in nuclear plant. We have also all the current uh, nuclear plant. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, which have a uh, long-term contract, so the, the price are are, uh, are uh, fixed, so merely fixed. We we don't have the same vo volatility uh, like uh, oil and gas, uh, but uh, uh, I don't see that there is a peak uh, occurring uh, in next year, next uh, next year. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Elodie. Uh, so we'll uh, continue. So there are other questions for the for the end. If we have time, or we will send them by uh, email. Um, okay. 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 So the last presentation uh, will be. Uh, from uh, Clio, so Clio Bossia. Clio is um, a geochemist and hydrogeologist uh, engineer at uh, Lithium de France. And its pre her presentation will be Lithium, its explo exploitation in brines and projects in France. Okay. So uh, Clio is, a, is an engineer at uh, Lithium de France, where she's in charge of the development of the extraction and valorization of the mineral resources from the geothermal reservoir. Uh, before she has been working for, uh, she, she, for uh, four years at uh, ESG Thermi, so in charge of the geochemical geochemical and environmental monitoring of uh, geothermal power plants in operation in Alsace, and also in charge of the research project for the extraction of lithium dissolved in uh, geothermal fluids, and previously research engineer at University of Strasbourg. So Clio has a PhD in geochemistry in Strasbourg and a, a, a master degree uh, from um, University of Montpellier. So thank you, Clio. Yeah. Anyway, we can start and I will talk to you about lithium, lithium uh, precisely in, uh, in brines. So the menu of the presentation is just a short word on Lithium de France, my company, then a panorama of the lithium resource, and then a focus on lithium in geothermal brine and particularly on deep geothermal project in France and an overview of the, um, the lithium potential that we have in geothermal fluids. 
Uh, and the last part will be dedicated to the extraction technologies that we call direct lithium extraction, DLA. And the main issues for, uh, for developing these technologies connected to the geothermal world uh, in the next uh, future. So Lithium de France is part of the Arverne group. It's quite, quite young group created three years ago with several subsidiaries. One is Arverne drilling, dedicating to all the drilling activities. Uh, one is Arverne resources. Uh, which operates in the ecological transition of mature oil field. And then there is Lithium de France. And the aim of Lithium de France is to develop um, geothermal energy and geothermal plants in France, uh, but also all around the world, and to link this uh, geothermal uh, exploitation with uh, other resources, valorization, and typically lithium. So we already have this um, short um, overview in the, in the presentation of Isabel, but historically lithium was used for ceramic and glasses production, but also for um, lubrificating products because it, was, it is like a solid chemical element um, that presents um, very good resistance to the high temperature. And then more recent uh, developments um, becoming one of the most important elements for uh, iron batteries uh, technologies. And this is due to the low electronegativity of the element uh, that bring him to be the, one of the dominant elements for this market sector. And uh, its consumption, as you can see in the in this graph will increase more and more in the future. Uh, one, one number that is very representative is, is the increasing um, between like four years ago and in four years, it will be more than 100%. And this is mainly due, as you know, to the electrification of the vehicle uh, market. In general, lithium is uh, until now, um, exploited by uh, the resources that we call conventional resources. Um, so mainly mining deposit like uh, Spodumen, uh, located in Australia, China, but also um, in the United States. And uh, Australia is um, without doubts the, the main producer uh, of lithium from mining deposit covering more or less uh, 40% of the lithium production of all over the world. And the other resource, typical resource is the salars. So uh, in, the, in the fluids um, coming from the, the salars, um, the, the countries that are um, the key producer in this case are uh, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile for South America, but also United States in North America. Um, so um, the, all the steps of refining uh, and all the transformation to the final product, so typically batteries, are uh, performed uh, by the Asian uh, like China, Korea, and Japan. And what we can see, and it's very clear on this map, is that Europe is completely absent on this, on this market as producer, but also as manufacturer of final products. And recently, other unconventional uh, lithium resources were or are explored. So, for example, we have alternative mining resources, but also uh, fluids containing lithium. So, seawater, of course, but also uh, oil field brines and what is interesting for us at this moment, geothermal brines. Um, this map was already presented by Isabel before, and I think it's just interesting to stop it, stop on it for a few moments, um, because the BRGM, uh, Blandine Gursrol, um, with other colleagues, have done a very good works on the mapping of the lithium potential in different geothermal brines around Europe. And the results are here. And what we can see is that uh, there are several spots that present very interesting concentration. 
Uh, in particular, we see there are several spots in France, in Italy, in Germany, but also in United Kingdom. And concentration may vary between a few dozen of ppm to several um, hundred of ppm, doing it a very interesting resource. So, of course, this mess, the key message of this map is there is a potential, but also uh, there, there are uh, lacking information on several countries. So um, it will be interesting next year to, uh, to perform more analysis and to obtain a, um, a more detailed database um, on this lithium potential of the Europe, um, Europe brine. Um, before getting into the subject of lithium uh, from geothermal brines, just a short uh, presentation uh, of the of the put different geothermal project that uh, that can be performed. So, of course, there is uh, what we call a very low low enthalpy project. So, like ground source heating and cooling, which are not interesting for us today. And then there are geothermal projects dedicated for to heat and power production. And among them. Uh, at least in French territory, we can have uh, first what we call uh, the shallow geothermal project. So it's project um, with a temperature with brine um, with a temperature below than 100, um, uh, 100 degree uh, with generally low or middle low depth to, to maximum two kilometer depth. Uh, and this is typically sedimentary basin, like the Parin basin. And the use of this uh, geothermal project is mainly uh, for district heating. And then there are deep geothermal projects, so deep or uh, very hot, uh, as uh, depending on the point of view. So, for example, there are projects in volcanic context, uh, which allow to attempt very, very high um, temperature uh, at quite low depth. So for example, more than two, 200 degree at just one, one kilometer depth. And these are mainly dedicated to electricity production. And then there are projects that are located in fractured reservoir, uh, which are um, generally uh, allowing to have temperature around 100, 200 degree, but at a higher depth compared to the volcanic context, so more two, three, or even more kilometers depth. And this is typically what happens in the upright gravel in Alsace, here on the map. And in this case, project can be dedicated both to electricity production or to um, eating supply. So as I say, there is this um, thermal, geothermal potential in the upper Rhine graben. So it's now uh, several decades that this potential is known with different projects that, um, that appears uh, slowly by slowly. And uh, the context, it's very interesting uh, in the upper Rhine graben because there is um, geothermal fluids that are naturally circulating through the reservoir. It's a granitic reservoir. They are still getting out, and then they uh, they get up um, towards the surface using the main fault system. So, what is interesting is developing project that uh, try to 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 down and to intersect this fault system and to reach the fluids that are very hot at the less uh, depth as possible. So, generally, those projects are composed of two wells: one production wells with very hot water. Then a surface um, surface installation to extract the energy and the calories, and then one injection well to reinject the, the, the cold water in the reservoir. And for the upper Rhine gravel, the typical operation condition are uh, bars and temperature, uh, let's say up to 170 degrees. And as I say, there are already several geothermal plants that are operating in the upper Rhine graben, both on the French and on the German side. And additional projects are ongoing uh, or uh, planned for the future. Um, the brines that are collected uh, in the 
in the geothermal uh, fluids uh, from the upper right graben have a very interesting chemical signatures. In general, it's a cl uh, chlo um, chloride sodium calcium brine with a pH that is around 5 or 5.5. An electrical conductivity that is more or less 120 millisiemens per centimeter, and the gas um, liquid ratio around one, with gas content uh, quite low, composed mainly by CO2, uh, um, N2, and methane. And this complex brine, it's not only enriched in these major ions, but also in other. Um, elements and typically lithium. Here you can see there is one graph that represents the lithium concentration for two sites. GPK2 uh, are the, are, is one well of the suits for a geothermal plant and G, GRT2 is a well of the Ritters of geothermal plant and uh, which present concentration more or less um, around 116, 170. Uh, ppm and in general uh, we can say the, the the lithium content of the brine in the upright gravel is between 150 and 200 ppm so what is interesting also to note if we look at the geochemical composition of the brines in this region is that the um, composition is very stable over time here you can have a look for example on the lithium <coughs> content, it is represented by the, the gray uh, points. And the, this is the evolution over time for the Ritter-Sulfen plant uh, at the production well, but also in the injection well uh, over the last four years. And what is interesting to see is that concentration are very stable. There are few variations which are mainly due to the analytical approach and to the standard error that we can have on the analysis, but uh, the message is really that the concentration are, are, are stable over time, uh, but also over space. And this is very well represented by this map where the concentration are, um, of the project uh, plant or well existing in the upper end graben are represented. And as you can see, they are very stable uh, included between, as I said before, 160 and 2000, uh, 200, sorry, ppm. And those information means that uh, we have in this region uh, a huge reservoir, well connected, that uh, is very homogeneous, that is very stable, that can thus represent a very interesting potential for the exploitation of this resource. And um, this is, of course, uh, the reason why there are several uh, existing and ongoing projects with several permits for lithium exploitation that are already uh, under instruction on the region. And it is interesting to see that there are um, some works that have been done in the past to try to evaluate the, the, the resource available on the, on the, on the region. Uh, there was one report of the BRGM that was dedicated just um, to the, let's say, Triassic um, reservoir, so with a porous, um, porous reservoir approach. And then when we try to include um, this fractured um, basement reservoir, uh, this estimation is even higher with uh, probably a production that can reach thousands of uh, ton of lithium carbonate equivalent per year for plant. Um, here, just a short overview. I won't go into details, but uh, of all the different projects and technologies that are under developed, uh, under development um, today. So you can see that there are French actors, for example, Eramet, or Radionix, or Geolite. Geolite. There are actors in Germany, uh, but also uh, on the other side of the seas, uh, in in. Um, in US and Canada, and also actors uh, in terms of operator that uh, want to develop um, lithium project and they are um, still looking for the, the right technologies to, to, to choose. Uh, the goal, 
let's say the, the, the extraction of lithium means that um, there is a, a direct lithium extraction plant that should be connected to the geothermal plant. Most of the time, the, the best design will be to connect it after the, the energy uh, extraction step. And this DLA technology uh, could deserve a first pretreatment of the water. Uh, maybe we can think about filtering uh, the particles or even uh, adapting some um, chemical features like the pH, for example. Then the brine is loaded to this um, absorption innovative material that trap the lithium uh, that is then eluted uh, through a different kind of solution could be water could be acid it depends on the on the process uh, allowing to uh, to have a lithium rich brine at the end and the, this lithium rich brine should go through several uh, steps adding steps like purification and concentration in order to produce at the end uh, the final product lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide and of course, the brine that uh, went through this uh, lithium absorption process then go to eventual post extraction treatment and then is reinjected in the geothermal plant. And well, let's say the technical issues, uh, the main technical issues uh, for geothermal um, for a geothermal scenarios is to be able to operate at high pressure and high temperature because. Uh, we really should avoid to depressurize the, the fluids in order to, um, to not have uh, secondary um, difficult processes uh, like corrosion or deposits of, of secondary minerals in the installation. The uh, typical, um, uh, let's say, scale of development is to have initially some lab tests on synthetic brine and very simplified condition, as you can see, for example, in this picture. Then an upgraded test with, for example, a lithium extraction skit with a low to process geothermal brines to be in a real condition of pressure and temperature and to have, a, well, a flow rate, um, let's say, a continuous flow rate for at least a short period. And finally, the last step will be uh, on site with a pilot, uh, of, of course, a small scale pilot, but uh, allowing to operate a higher flow rate for longer period and to produce enough lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide to test the, 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 the quality and the, the, sweet, um, the suitable of the products uh, to, for, for battery production. So as I said before, uh, one of the main future goals will be to develop a direct lithium extraction technology that uh, make the proof of concept. Uh, but not only, it will also be important to um, design uh, this uh, extraction technologies and to integrate it correctly to the geothermal uh, operational constraints and to create a synergy between the lithium process and the geothermal process. It would also be important to work on the, on the reservoir characterization and understanding of the lithium um, processes in the reservoir in order to have a, a more detailed um, view of the, the resource, the, the availability and the durability over time. And also it will be important to push to create a, a, a complete lithium value chain in Europe, for example, uh, with developing local uh, refinery units, but also uh, a market for uh, battery production. And to conclude, uh, an overview of the projects that are ongoing actually in, uh, in France, there is uh, Eugelai, Isabel have a short um, uh, some short uh, comments uh, involving several partners and they are already testing with in situ tests on the on two um, um, plants in the in the upper Rhine Graben. There is the unlimited project that is uh, on the German side. Uh, with the um, aims to investigate um, lithium in, in deep waters in the, the whole Germany territories, 
and they are also uh, building uh, a pilot unit uh, in order to test it to uh, uh, one of the, the, the plants present on the, on the German side of the Upper Rhine Graben. There is Volcano Energy Resources, uh, who wants to develop lithium. He already has three exploration permits that are granted and several that are under application, but he's um, still looking for uh, the right technologies. And finally, Lithium de France, one of the last actors uh, appearing uh, uh, in recent times, uh, where the, 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 the idea is really to be able to co-valorize at the same time lithium and geothermal resources. And uh, we already have one uh, exploration permit under application. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clio. So we will move to the question so, uh, from the uh, first one uh, from Jean-Jacques. So thank you, Clio. Excellent presentation and fluent English in terms of uh, fluent English. In terms of economical value, what is the best? Produce power from geothermal production or recover lithium from, from brines? Um, well, let's see. Uh, produce power, it's not from geothermal brine, uh, it's not very interesting because the conversion between uh, calories uh, extracted from the fluids and the uh, electricity that, that we have to give to the grid is very low. There are a lot of losses in this conversion. But what is more interesting for geothermal brine exploitation is to use direct, directly the heat that is extracted from the brine. And in this case, there are no uh, losses. And in this case, um, let's say that the business plan of the two activities, it's not enough developed for the moment to, to give the answer uh, to your question. But of course, if we compare uh, power uh, to lithium, lithium will be the best choice. And if we compare it to lithium, it will depend also on the extraction technologies that will be uh, selected at the end. Okay, uh, another one. Uh, thank you, Clio. Do you f do you fix a cutoff minimum minimal lit lithium content for your explo exploration targets, or only looking at geothermal energy temperature first? Um, we try to have both uh, parameters in our goal. Um, let's say we cannot operate with very low uh, lithium concentration and neither with very low temperature. So, of course, both of them are important. That what we can see is that also depends for uh, temperature. It depends on the use we want to have of the heat and also on the deal between temperature and depth because we can have a um, situation where we don't have a lot of temperature but we have wells that are very shallow so it, it still be interesting and for lithium it will depend once again from the final uh, extraction technologies because what we can see is that depending on the project and on the technologies um, there could be some minimal concentration that are necessary to have a good extraction capacity. And for other technologies, there is no uh, minimal level. So it will also be uh, an important um, key parameter to, um, to address our research. Um, OK, uh, another one. Uh, do you think the deep brines get enriched in lithium due to the trias evaporite deposits or the source is deeper? <laughs> this is a very good question. Um, for the moment, it's not very easy to say it because we have analysis on the fluids, but we have very low analysis, very few in the rocks. Um, the main analysis in the rocks are uh, in the granite. And... <clears throat> There are almost no data like uh, from the different mineral phases to understand which minerals are, are, are actually um, at the origin of the lithium. But let's say the two hypotheses that, uh, that are circulating uh, um, actually presently is either an origin from really the granitic basement or from the upper layer like the sandstone. 
due to the un, un enrichment in the biotite fields. Okay. Um, okay, we will we'll do a last question because we are a bit late. Uh, okay, alors. Looking at, uh, at other metal co product in brines already with diff. Uh, no. I don't understand the, the question, Isabelle. Um, I think I understand. Uh, because actually, um, today we talk a lot about lithium, but of course, uh, as, uh, as I try to, to, to say you at one moment in the presentation, uh, brines are enriched in a lot of different material, a lot of different elements, and other elements could be interesting. Uh, at, at least from a market point of view, a demand and price. But then we, we do not have uh, a lot of uh, technologies that are available today uh, to be like plugged to a geothermal uh, site and tested for the extraction of other elements. So of course we keep it in our mind, but uh, it will demand another, um, let's say another chapter of development and we, we are not, um, it's not our priority today. Okay, okay, thank you very much, uh, Clio. We stop uh, here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for your attention. Thank you to the to the to all the speakers.